This evening, we are entering Elul, as I said at the beginning of the service. In some ways, it's like New Year's Eve, except it's New Year's Eve month. Instead of New Year's Eve day or New Year's Eve night, it's an entire month where actually there are no other holidays or formal observances in the month. It's the only holiday, only month rather, in the Jewish calendar that is like that, with no other holidays or fast days or other observances. It's simply the beginning of the month with what's called Rosh Chodesh, the, the new moon of the month. There's Shabbat, of course, during the weeks, and that's it. No other major holidays to observe. So it really creates a space for you to think about what this time could be. And in fact, if you count from the beginning of Elul, from Rosh Chodesh Elul, down to Yom Kippur, you get 40 days. Remember hearing about 40 days anywhere? 40 days of the flood. Moses is up on Mount Sinai for 40 days when he's receiving the Ten Commandments. And in fact, many Jewish cultural groups will connect this period of 40 days from the beginning of Elul to the end of Yom Kippur with that time in the story of Moses where things were in the balance and it wasn't sure where things were going to go. It was a time of judgment in that mythology. It's also a time of judgment in rabbinic mythology too. Now, as I said at the outset, our approach to what we do during this month of Elul depends on what the meaning of the new year is for us. I mean, after all, if our new year is about the beginning of school, we're taking vacations now. That's where many people are right now. Um, if the beginning of the new year for some families is a meal, <laughs> it's the Rosh Hashanah meal that everyone comes together and has a brisket or some other kind of major production. There are some traditional foods that are actually served on Rosh Hashanah. Um, carrots, for example, in Ashkenazi culture were an important part of Rosh Hashanah because the word for carrot in Yiddish was meren. And the idea was you should have more and more things. Um, and so you eat a food that has a sort of punny wordplay on uh, to increase and to redound. And so that was one of the uh, traditional foods assigned. There was uh, eating fish heads was one of the traditions because you want to be the not only the head of the year at Rosh Hashanah, but you want things to go forward and forward um, as you would uh, in the new year. So having food may be part of your Rosh Hashanah celebration. And so the purpose of Elul is menu planning, is invitations, is finding the folding chairs, is you know figuring out how you're gonna fit everybody at the table. Um, or if you're organizing the break the fast at Yom Kippur, which some families do, and some families don't wait till sundown, they do the break the fast at two, three in the afternoon, they may not even be fasting. But the idea of having a break the fast event becomes an important tradition. And so the holiday is more about the food than it is about observance, penitence, or a new year, or even community. Uh, when I was first working as a rabbi in Detroit, my wife's family originally is from Windsor, Ontario. And one of her grandmothers could never understand why we couldn't be at her house for Rosh Hashanah dinner. And I tried to explain to her, well, I'm a rabbi. I work in the synagogue. I have to get there early to set up, and I can't be an hour's drive away for a dinner that starts at 6 when our service starts at 7.30. It, it's not going to work. She could not understand. But Rosh Hashanah dinner is the holiday. Well, for some people it is. Now, in the traditional rabbinic understanding, Rosh Hashanah was a time of judgment. In fact, not just Rosh Hashanah, the entire 10-day period of Rosh Hashanah to Yom Kippur was a time of judgment. Now, we also face times of judgment. If we're in school, we turn in test papers or essays. If we are in jobs, we have evaluations. Sometimes we have to give evaluations. Sometimes we receive evaluations. But we face this experience of judgment all the time in our experience. And the question is what you would do if you knew you were going to be facing judgment. If we think about Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur as a time of judgment, how would we approach being judged? If we knew that we'd already been found guilty, that's the assumption behind many of these. If you have nothing to worry about, then why would you care about facing judgment? I always liked taking tests because I did well. But some people are worried about judgment, and so they understand that they don't know. They're not complete. They're not perfect. They are guilty in some sense. So what might you do? Now I'm going to open this up for uh, your responses. What might you do if you found yourself facing judgment from a court? How might you prepare yourself or prepare your message to the court, knowing the court is going to be judging you. What might be some of the steps that you would take? If anybody here talks, I'll just repeat it into my mic, and anybody online, you're welcome to unmute and, and jump in. I would get familiar with the laws I would be judged upon. For okay, those so you'd want to know exactly what to expect in terms of sentencing? Yeah? 
Yeah, Larry. Assuming I'm not guilty of whatever it is I'm about to be judged for, I, I want to make sure I had uh, my ducks in a row and make sure everything's done my case. Well, Larry's still arguing the case, but he's not willing to concede that the court has found him guilty. Uh, <laughs> this is the assumption. The assumption is you've done something wrong. And so you have to figure out how can I prepare for sentencing? Uh, how do I mitigate the sentence? How do I manage the situation knowing that I'm, I've already been found guilty? What else might you do? Beg for mercy? Okay. Take responsibility and apologize. Ah, so taking responsibility, show contrition, repentance, apology, sure. Make sure that you have excellent representation so that you'll be treated fairly. Okay, maybe use intermediaries or try to, you know, uh, get in good with somebody who knows somebody who can uh, give you a more lenient sentence. I have a yeah, Rich. You can see Rich. I would uh, make sure I understand the the uh, routes for appeal. <laughs> Are there grounds for appeal? Is there a higher court that I can take this to? I mean, the challenge when it's divine judgment. I don't know that there's a higher court in that uh, in that theological. <laughs> <laughs> you might wear your nicest clothes, right? You might say nice things to the judge. Um, you know, you, you try to make a good impression. Or maybe you go the opposite route and you wear poor clothes, you know, clothes that have tears or stains that you, you look pitiable. And then maybe they'll have mercy on you. you know, two opposite strategies. Now, what if you were facing judgment from a parent? Put yourself back in the 10 years old, 15 years old category. Your parent has caught you, you're out after curfew, you ate too many cookies, you, you know, whatever happened that you broke the rules um, and you are facing sentence. You've been found guilty. How do you approach a situation where a parent is going to be judging you? What might you do? I think oftentimes you argue uh, the reasonableness of the rule when it's a okay. child, especially. Okay, so if you're in the lawyer stage of being a child, you'll try to get out on a technicality or otherwise um, challenge. Uh, this whole court is out of order, you know, take right. the, uh, uh, th that particular strategy. If you're young enough, you cry. <laughs> Maybe you cry. What's the, what is the objective of crying? before judgment. Pity. <laughs> Again, looking for pity, right? Sometimes crying really isn't about pity. It's just an emotional response. Right. I mean, it might be something you can't control. You're not consciously planning to do it. Maybe you are. It's a way of showing contrition, repentance, the same kind of things we talked about with the court. Maybe saying, you know, I really feel bad. And I, I promise it won't happen again. You know, that, that might be a genuine sentiment, not just a, a strategy. Maybe just say, I'm sorry, but here's why I did it. Ah, so providing reason and explanation for why it might have happened. Okay, that might work for the parent. You might also take the strategy that sports teams do and punish yourself first. You know, when a university is caught cheating on recruitment or uh, uh, training or off-season workouts or so on, and the NCAA is going to punish them, they often punish themselves first and they vacate their wins and they give back money as an attempt to sort of preempt the punishment that's going to be imposed from outside. So the child might make themselves, you know, looking pitiable is not just a sign of contrition, it's also self-punishment. Look at how much I am already hurting emotionally, so why would you hurt me anymore? I'm already suffering, I've already been punished, by the guilt I feel, by the pain I've caused, and so on. So, uh, and sometimes kids will even, you know, offer, I, I give up this for a month because this, ha they'll, they'll offer a punishment first um, as a, a way of trying to mitigate the judgment. Anyone else on uh, dealing with a parent's judgment? I think if you're uh, trying to think about restorative justice, maybe what can I do mm. positive instead of just saying you're sorry, which my parents always said was meaningless, empty thing to do. What Now, what are you gonna do? 
to show either that you're sorry or somehow do something positive to you know improve the situation right good what if you're facing judgment from a peer whether it's in a social setting or in a work setting um, what might be different from the strategies that you take because of course in a court or with your parents there's a hierarchy there what if you're dealing with judgment from a peer how might you approach the situation differently Yeah, please. So try to find a common ground and find a better relationship to understand each other. So you have a common vocabulary, points of reference. They, again, to help them understand where you're coming from and why you might have done what you did. Mm -hmm. Try to bring them in. Would you have handled the same circumstance? Ah, so put, ask them to put themselves in your shoes. How might you, have, what might you have done in that circumstance? And then maybe it's more understandable. Sure. So now the last one, perhaps the hardest. What if you're facing a time of judging yourself? We can be sometimes the hardest, ju you know, judges and critics of our own behavior. Uh, how might we prepare ourselves for a process of self-evaluation. It could be with a therapist and in a therapeutic setting, or it could be simply in an individual setting where you're looking back on the year or on a particular event and you think, you know what, I didn't handle that as well as I should have. I made some mistakes. How do we approach that process of judging ourselves? What have I learned from this and how can I move forward and have a different outcome in the future? Okay, so using it as a learning process, what can I do better going forward, as opposed to beating yourself up over the past, um, you know, going in circles. Joyce, were you gonna add something, or Rich? No, I was, I'd say co commit to a, a new behavior. Okay, so make some kind of commitments to yourself. Some people even make public commitments. You know, if they're quitting smoking, they give people cards saying, I'm quitting smoking to reinforce it with other people. So that they're judging themselves, but they're making it a public commitment to do so and to do better. Well, these are all different layers of judging that you can imagine being part of a New Year's celebration, uh, whether you're in a religious context or in a more secular and humanistic context. That concept of judging and improving your behavior is something everybody can use. Again, it's one of those pieces of the human experience that's valuable that we might want to save. But I did want to give you some examples of what the traditional approach is to this kind of judgment period. Um, there's a whole body of prayers specifically written for this month of Elul called Slichot. If you know anything about modern Hebrew, modern Hebrew, the word for excuse me is Slicha. It's the same root as Slichot. Slichot are the apology prayers, the forgive me prayers that are designed for this period specifically. For Ashkenazi Jews from Eastern Europe, they generally begin reciting these prayers the Saturday night before Rosh Hashanah starts. However, like this year, if there's Saturday night before Rosh Hashanah isn't four days or more, they go the Saturday before the Saturday before. Since Rosh Hashanah starts on a Monday evening, there'd only be two days of apologies. That's clearly not enough because we've done so many things wrong. So we need an extra period of time. We go back to the Saturday night before. And why Saturday night? Well, it's thought that because God is happy after Shabbat, he's in a good frame of mind, that's a good time to ask for apologies and forgiveness. You know, this is also a strategy. If you're going to a parent to apologize, you have to strike at the right moment. <laughs> and your timing is very important. Okay, so let me share with you some texts from the traditional prayers. We're not going to go through all of them, obviously, but just enough to give you a flavor of it. So this is recited in the Ashkenazi ritual, uh, again, from that Saturday before. By the way, Sephardic Jews start at 40 days before. They do that counting down. 40 days, you know, uh, leading into Yom Kippur. They actually start at the beginning of Rosh Chodesh Elul, so they do it for all 40 days, including the days in between Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur. They're adding these apology, apology prayers. And this is the flavor of what they sound like. Fortunate are those who dwell in your house. May they continue to praise you, Selah. Fortunate is the people whose lot is thus. Fortunate is the people for whom Adonai is their God, a praise by David. I will exalt you, my God, the King, and bless your name forever and ever. I will exalt you and bless you and extol your name forever and ever. Adonai is great and highly extolled. His greatness is unfathomable. What's the strategy here? Flattery. <laughs> it's buttering up the judge. Okay. 
Your, I, of your awesome might, they will speak. Of your greatness, I will recount. They will make mention of your bountifulness, exult in your righteousness. And now, let's highlight a particular wonderful quality. Adonai is gracious and compassionate, slow to anger and great in kindliness. He is good to all. His mercy encompasses all his works. You're such a wonderful person being at forgiving. Hint, hint, hint. Adonai supports the fallen and straightens all the bent. The eyes of all look expectantly to you. He is just in all his ways, benevolent in all his deeds. He's near to those who call on him, who, all who call on him in truth. He watches over those who love him. Praise uh, of Adonai, my mouth will declare. All flesh will bless his holy name forever and ever. Praise God. And then the Chazan recites the half Kaddish, which is that Yitkadal Yitkadal's prayer. Uh, not only used for uh, memorials, by the way, it's also used as a regular praise of God during the service. This is one example. And then having given all that praise in chapter one on the first day, here is chapter two. Righteousness is yours, Adonai, while shame is ours. How can we complain? What can we say? What can we speak? And how can we justify ourselves? Let us search into our ways and examine them and return to you. For your right hand is extended to, the, to receive those who repent. Not with virtue, nor with good deeds do we come before you, but like the poor and needy, we knock at your door. Please do not turn us away empty-handed from your presence. So this is not a, I've gotten a great defense attorney, and I'm going to tell you what I did right. This is a, it doesn't matter what I did right. I did these wrong things. I am not coming here to defend myself. You know, that's, by the way, one of those examples of how not to apologize. You know, when you start defending yourself and explaining, well, I did it because of it. No, if you're apologizing, sometimes you got to own it and you got to dive in the deep end and accept the fact that you were wrong. Uh, and again, a little more flattery here. Let us prostrate ourselves and bow. Let us kneel. I mean, again, the, the sort of hierarchy is highlighted here, right? Like the king and the royalty, you bow, you kneel, you prostrate yourself down, even flat on your Kippur at one point in the service, people lie flat on the ground, their face on the ground. Uh, this is part of the traditional ritual of the hierarchy of the judge. Let us come to his dwelling places. Let us prostrate ourselves at his foothold. Exalt Adonai and prostrate yourselves. See the difference? Exalt him and lay yourself down. Uh, again, some more flattery. You're, you do wonderful things uh, in the height of your mountains. You crawl, and a, a list of past highlights. Yours are the heavens, yours is the earth. You set all the borders of the earth, summer and winter, you formed them. You crushed the heads of Leviathan, you gave him as food to the people of legions. You split open the fountain and brook, you dried up mighty rivers, you crumbled the sea with your strength. You, you can do all these wonderful things. And forgiving me is like easy. Look at all the, t the wonderful things that you've done. And again, it's calling uh, to return under the wing. Pardon us, our Father, because of our great foolishness. We have sinned. Forgive us, our King, for our iniquity is great. Now, there's one other appeal here that's interesting. Our God and God of our fathers. Remember, we talked about a judge versus a parent. And God in these prayers often functions as a little bit of both. He's the remote judge of all the universe, but he's also an intimate God who was the God of my ancestor. He's a family God, not just a remote God of the universe. And again, it begins, who are we to dare to speak? How can we open our mouths before you who dwells in the heavens? In what manner can we pour out words of prayer? We have rejected your upright and honest ways. We cling to abominations. And that, again, it's the confession, confession, mea culpa, mea culpa, mea culpa maxima. We have adhered to false and misleading concepts. We've been stubborn and brazen. You were angered at us. The temple, our secure abode, you destroyed in the pleasing aroma of sacrifices. Cease. In the past, we blew it. In the present, we've blown it. <laughs> and you punished us justly then. You could punish us justly now. But if we confess, if we admit, if we own up, maybe we can avert the decree. From then even until now, we have been scattered. We have been killed. We have slaughtered and butchered. We are a bare remnant of the nations who tear at us like painful thorns. Those who enslave your people who bow down to false gods, why do they succeed morning till night? You who live eternally, Holy One, see the humiliation of those who groan, they rely on you, and to you they cleave. The awesome, with the awesome might of your right hand, deliver them for eternity. Now, this is a very interesting strategy if you think about it psychologically. The people of Israel are saying to God, we're your chosen people, and look at how badly we're suffering. 
maybe for your own reputation, you might want to intervene and, you know, give us a leg up once in a while and, uh, you know, help yeah. us out here. You know, it's, it's for your benefit too. Yes. Um, but there's also a sense that um, there's something wrong, that the, if we are truly cleaving to you, if we are truly doing what you want us to do, following the commandments, reciting the praises and the prayers, reading the Torah scroll, following the halakot, the, the laws you've given us of purity and of practice, if we're truly doing all that, then you should save us. <laughs> then you should forgive us for this, the transgressions, but also this, uh, it's time for redemption. We trust your abundant mercy and your righteousness we rely on. Your, for your pardon we hope, for your deliverance we yearn. You made a covenant with the patriarchs. Again, that family appeal, right? And you'll keep your oath with their descendants. You are he who descended in glory on Mount Sinai, disclosed the ways of your goodness to Moses, your servant. You revealed to him and you made known to him that you are almighty, merciful, gracious, slow to anger, abounding in kindness, full of beneficence, guiding the entire world with the quality of mercy. And so it is written... I will cause my name to, and my goodness to pass before you, and I will proclaim the name Adonai in your presence. I'll be gracious to whom I will be gracious, and I'll be compassionate to whom I will be compassionate. And you hear these same words over and over again. Gracious, mercy, compassion, slow to anger. And this is actually a citation from the Hebrew Bible in Exodus chapter 34, where Moses is on the mountain. He's actually receiving the replacement Ten Commandments. You may remember the first set of Ten Commandments he broke because he got mad at the golden calf. And that was a problem. So he had to go back and get a replacement Ten Commandments. Interesting side note, the second version is not the same as the first version he got. If you read all of Exodus 34, he gives a list of commandments that some are similar and some are very different from the ones in Exodus 20. But, oh well, uh, interesting uh, note for archaeologists to investigate. But in this case, Moses carves the tablets and he brings the tablets up with him. And now here in verse 5, you hear that the Lord, or Yahweh, which is the name for the Hebrew God, came down in a cloud, and he proclaimed the name Yahweh. And then Yahweh passed before him, and Yahweh himself says, Yahweh, Yahweh. So he's praising himself in the third person <laughs> by using his own name. You know, the Lord, the Lord, Yahweh, Yahweh, a God compassionate and gracious, slow to anger, abounding in kindness and faithfulness. This is a famous prayer. El Rahum v'chanun, erech apayim v'rav chesed v'emet. And it goes on in the next verse extending kindness to the thousandth generation, forgiving iniquity, transgression, and sin. When you praise what's called the 13 attributes of God in Slichot prayers and other places, that's where the quote ends. Forgiving iniquity, transgression, and sin, period. But you'll notice the verse in the book of Exodus goes on and says, yet he does not remit all punishment, but visits the sin of parents upon children and children's children upon the third and fourth generation. Well, if you're in a mercy mood, you don't want to remind him of that, necessarily. <laughs> That's not going to be helpful. So that part of the verse is often not cited. They cite the positive stuff instead. So this is all one strategy of atonement, appeasement, flattery, reminding of uh, connections. But there's another approach that you could take to this time of judgment. Because after all, a lot of these are to atone for things you did between you and God, eating the wrong foods lighting candles at the wrong time. But what about the things that I did wrong to Larry? The things that Larry did wrong to me? How do we deal with those? And in Maimonides' Mishnah Torah, his Code of Jewish Law, he has a wonderful passage that talks about the need for atoning between people. This is the next passage here. Neither repentance nor the day of atonement atone for any save sins committed between man and God. For example, someone who ate forbidden food or had forbidden coitus, etc. But sins between people when one injures his neighbor or curses his neighbor and plunders him or offends him, is not ever absolved until he makes restitution of what he owes and begs the forgiveness of his neighbor. That's the restitution we heard before. And although he makes restitution of the monetary debt, he's obliged to pacify him and beg his forgiveness. So even if I pay you back for the fence post I broke, it's not enough. I still have to apologize and ask for you to forgive me. Even if he offended not his neighbor in anything but words, He's obliged to appease him and implore him until he is forgiven by him. If his neighbor refuses a committee of three friends to forgive him, he should bring, uh, uh, he should bring a committee of three friends with him to get forgiveness and beg him. If he refuses, the neighbor should bring a second, even a third committee. And if he still remains obstinate, he may leave it to himself and pass on. For then the sin rests upon him who refuses forgiveness. If you've tried that much, 
and apologized and made restitution and brought three different committees of three people to come. At that point, it's your problem and you're the one that's committed the sin by not forgiving. But if it happens to be his master, his teacher, he should go and come to forgiveness even a thousand times until he does forgive him. Now, on the flip side, someone has wronged you. Are you obligated to forgive them? It is forbidden for man to be ill-natured and unforgiving, for he must be easily appeased, but unwidely uh, to wrath. And when a sinner implores him for pardon, he should grant him pardon wholeheartedly and soulfully. Even if one persecuted him and sinned against him exceedingly, he should not be vengeful and grudge-bearing. For such is the path of the seed of Israel and of their excellent hearts. So the ideal version is, don't hold a grudge, let it go. Only the idolaters are not so. This is the us versus them approach, assuming that everybody outside the group are bad people and they don't forgive. Their, wa their wrath is ever watchful. And one who commits a sin against a friend and the friend died before he could ask forgiveness. What about that? You should bring 10 adults, a minion, to his grave and there say, I have sinned against the Lord God of Israel and against this man. I have done him so until you confess the sin in front of witnesses. If he was indebted to him, he should return the money to his heirs. And if he doesn't know who his heirs are, he gives the money to the court after his confession is delivered. So this is a really powerful statement of the need for interpersonal apology and forgiveness, even to the point of going back to the same person again and again to ask them to forgive you and being willing yourself to forgive someone who comes to you who's wronged you. In fact, there's a later passage we're not going to look at today that describes how you actually have to make yourself available to the person who wronged you. You can't just like leave town. You have to stick around and let them come to you to apologize, to restore that relationship. Now, do we need cosmic leverage? Do we need to think that a God is watching us to do all of this? Well, I'll be honest, um, if nobody's watching, maybe I don't need to make myself available to the person who wronged me. If I don't think I'm going to be judged for not forgiving, maybe I won't forgive. Maybe that's the easier route. But this is where we have to take that humanistic turn, where instead of looking beyond ourselves for surveillance and role modeling and authority, we look within ourselves and to other people. Maybe it's our reputation that motivates us to do better. Maybe it's our sense of self that motivates us to do better. Maybe it's our extension of how we would like to be treated, we treat other people. And so if we would like to be forgiven, we need to be able to forgive ourselves. You see, this is the meaning of our Jewish New Year. It is self-examination. It is repairing relationships in the vein of a traditional setting. But for many of us, the Jewish New Year is also a time of Jewish connections. It's when we feel connected to our people, our heritage, our culture, we feel part of a broader community. And for those who are members of a specific congregation, it's a time to connect as a community, to see faces we haven't seen, to hear voices we haven't heard, to catch up, to reconnect. And so that's why last year for the High Holidays was so difficult because we didn't get that moment of being together. We had schmooze Zoom rooms and it was as good as it could be, but it wasn't the same as that community connection. So if these are our goals, Jewish connections, community connections, self-examination in trying to repair relationships, we should spend our time in Elul thinking about how do we prepare for those goals. And after all, those might be hard to work on. You know, repairing relationships is not easy. Examining yourself is not easy. Having a sense of what your life and what your cultural background is about, that's not easy. And some, for, for many people, connecting to community is a challenge as well. Some of us are more comfortable with three people than they are with 30 people. And that's okay. But this is part of why we sometimes push ourselves to feel those connections more broadly and to feel part of something larger than ourselves. It has other benefits that are important to our sense of self and our sense of Jewishness. In the end, perhaps the most important meaning of Elul for us is the concept of a midrash, a commentary that plays with the spelling of the word Elul, which in Hebrew is written Aleph, Lamed, Vav, Lamed, Elul. But it's also described in this commentary as an acronym for a famous phrase from the Song of Songs. Ani ladodi vadodi li. I am my beloved's and my beloved is mine. That is interpersonal connection. In this case, a loving connection, but it could also be for a friendship. After all, another passage in Song of Songs says, 
um, Zedodi vezero e. This is my beloved, and this is my companion. This is my friend. Those are both parts of making connections. So, as you think to our Jewish New Year and looking forward to this month of Elul, the next few weeks we have, which goal do you think you would find both most challenging and most rewarding of those four that I mentioned? The connection to being Jewish, the connection to this community, the connection to self-examination and that process, and most importantly, the need to repair relationships. I think I think of repairing relationships as the most important, but you might rank them differently. So I'm curious for you here or online, which of those goals, Jewish connection, community connection, self-examination or repairing relationships, would you either find the most challenging to do or perhaps the most important to do? Yeah, Larry. So let's do this. Yeah, we can just pass it back. Yes, uh, I was saying. I, I think self-examination is the most difficult because uh, it's very hard to be honest with myself. There's there's nobody to call me on it but me if I kind of recreate the facts a little bit. Right. So uh, it's difficult. Yeah. Um, I feel that. I feel that uh, rebuilding relationships with others is probably difficult because you can never, you can never expect forgiveness as well. You know, you have to, despite, you know, despite anything, you have to be considerate of that other person's feelings as well. So it's probably a difficult thing for a lot of people. Right. That's right. Well, these are hard things, you know, and there are also things that we might not feel comfortable talking about in a group setting. Uh, we might not even feel comfortable talking about in a therapeutic setting. Um, and this is something that our ancestors didn't have. They didn't have therapy. <laughs> they had religion, they had clergy, and they had this kind of public setting demanding these kind of personal challenges and changes. Um, and I would argue there is a kind of psychological wisdom in there to do that. Perhaps it's not the most comfortable setting to confess your sins in front of everybody, or perhaps it's more performative. It's not as personal as doing that to yourself in the mirror or doing it to the person that you wrong directly. Uh, but I would argue that there is some psychological wisdom in there, even if we don't need it directed above, and we prefer to have it directed outwardly or even inwardly as we move forward into the new year. So you have a few weeks between now and Rosh Hashanah. I encourage you to take this time to think carefully about your relationships to yourself and your own sense of self, your relationships to other people, and your relationships to the broader community, whether it's a Jewish community, a geographic community, or a congregational community.